God bless today's gospel reading. Today we're going to be continuing, like I said, on the uh, Lord's Prayer. The model that Jesus gave His disciples to pray when they pray. For them to use. And we worked our way through a good portion of it. We're near the end. And we're coming to some people's favorite and some people's not so favorite part of it just because of what it says. But it's it's the F word. Forgiveness. And forgiveness is one of those double-edged swords, isn't it? Right? It's good to receive. Sometimes it's very hard to forgive. And in different translations you see it used as debt or debtedness. Um, trespasses. Transgressions. Uh, it's, it's, it's titled different ways. It would be like the young boy who who was very confused about the Lord's Prayer, he said, forgive us our trash cans and those who try to put trash in our cans. <laughs> and as comical as that is, that's probably not too far from the truth, is it? You know, forgive us our garbage. <laughs> forgive us our sins, our failures, and, and those type things. And forgive those who try to draw us into their sin and their garbage. Uh, and that's what we're going to kind of be talking about today. You know, forgiveness is a gift. <coughs> it's a present. It's something that's given to you, it's offered to you. It's not something you can demand, is it? You can't say, I'm to, you forgive me right now, right? But it's, it's not, that's not the way it works, is it? No. It's something that has to be offered by a person or God to us, right? It's something that's given. And as easy as it's given, it is supposed to be passed on. Correct? We receive forgiveness from God, and that's all well and good, and we love that concept. But how hard is it to pass that forgiveness on to others? Yet that is what we're called to do. And in today's prayer, we see that. You know, forgiveness isn't cheap. Especially when it comes to us. It costs something, right? It takes sacrifice on one person's part to forgive another. Or for God to forgive us. But God in His amazing compassion and love for humanity did just that, didn't He? He sent His Son to come and live among men and die on a cross for each of us so that we could receive forgiveness. That's not cheap. As a matter of fact, that's, that's a very expensive present. A very expensive gift. And as Jesus was here, He mentioned forgiveness numerous times. Did He not? Remember the woman caught in adultery? He said, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. Salvation has come to your house today. To the paralyzed man laying before Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. Rise and walk. Even on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I would say Jesus was all about forgiveness. Wouldn't you? And if that's the case, then it's displayed. Why do you think that, and we're forgiven, which I think is a no brainer As Christians, as followers of Christ, I can, with all confidence, say to you, by the blood of Jesus Christ, you have been forgiven. That Christ has paid the price for you. For you, for you, for you, for you, for you, for me, the folks out there. Christ came and died for us all. So with all confidence, like I say, a repentant heart is a forgiven heart. One that believes in Christ has already received that forgiveness. So why is it, do you think, that Jesus, in this model, this, this, this prayer He's given His disciples, says 
and pray for forgiveness. Change, would you say? For forgiveness. So why should we pray for forgiveness? And I would say you are forgiven. And, and, and I would say this, and present this to you. Maybe it was to remind us that we are people that need to be forgiven. You know, it says us. It says forgive us. Again, we're talking about community. We're talking about all of us. Right? Need to be forgiven. And maybe it was to remind us we're not perfect. Besides Ronnie's guitar case, which nobody sitting on the perfect pew up here. Nobody sits up here, right? And why is it? Not because I call it a perfect pew, but because we're not perfect people, are we? That try as we may, as hard as we can, we still mess up. I do. Do you? I mean, I try not to. It's not my intention. I don't get up and say, I'm going to sin or I'm going to do something today that's be unpleasing to God. But sometimes, I, I, I'm human being. I make mistakes. Do you make mistakes? Right? So, so we all are in constant need of forgiveness. Right? And maybe that's what God is reminding us of. Maybe He's reminding us, maybe you shouldn't be so hard on others for their sin. Because you should remember that you, too, are a sinner. That you, too, have failures in life. That you, too, fall short of what God has intended your life to be from time to time, if not every day, probably at least on a weekly basis. We need to be mindful of that. Perhaps that's why the story is told of the woman caught in adultery. Do you remember that story? Turn to me to John chapter 8, second, second, uh, we're going, I'm going to start with John chapter 8, verse 2, and I'm going to uh, read through it real quick for you, okay? It says, now in the early morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and sat down, and, he, and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her... In the, in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And he said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Hmm. Kind of strange, isn't it? Jesus knew the scriptures, the holy writings, the Torah, the Jewish laws that called for this woman to be stunned. But yet that's not what he called for, is it? He showed compassion and love and forgiveness to this woman caught in adultery. That should be a great comfort to you. Not that you're an adulterer. But you are a sinner. God doesn't interchange sin. Sin is sin. Sin means to fall short. To miss the target. 
And we're all sinners. And some are spelled out more clearly and punishments more clearly in the Bible than others. But sin is sin. Don't think that your sin is any less than anyone else's. Right? Perhaps that was, was what Jesus was trying to teach us. You know, if we look at this thing, he, he, Jesus is sitting there and He's teaching. He's teaching people. It's early in the morning. These Pharisees, the Sadducees, they bring this woman caught in adultery right up to Him. And they're looking to trap Him into what He'll say. Can you imagine that scene? How humiliating for that woman. Caught in adultery. Dragged there. Probably half clothes standing there. Trying to keep her, her garments on. Ashamed. Terrified. Knowing that what the commandments, what the law calls for is for her to be stoned. Knowing that her death is all but imminent. It's, it's, it's going to happen. She stands there. Amongst them all, the men standing there, each of them holding a stone meant for her execution. Stones that, when thrown, would break bone and tear flesh, that would slowly, piece by piece, destroy this woman, that would end her life. And they come to Jesus and they ask a question in order to trap him. She's been caught in adultery, the law says. To stone her, what would you have us to do? And what does he do? He kneels down. And he writes in the sand. Now we don't know what he wrote. There's been much speculation. Some have said, well, perhaps he wrote her name. Or perhaps he wrote their sins, those who were in the crowd. Or perhaps he wrote their names of those in the crowd. <coughs> the same. That would fulfill uh, Jeremiah, I think, 17, 13, which says that those who turn on the Lord's name will be written in the earth, will be written in the dust. We don't know. It doesn't really clarify. And I guess it really doesn't matter that much, does it? point is, whatever it is that he put forward, whatever it is he wrote in the sand, affected it. And his words affected it. Because he asked that really simple question. He stood up and he said, that he who is without sin cast the first stone. Can you imagine that woman standing what she was thinking? I'm in for it now. Here they come. Here come the stones. I wonder if she closed her eyes and just waited for it. <coughs> instead of stones hitting her, she heard the sounds of stones being dropped. <coughs> that thud of a stone hitting the dirt one by one as each realized they too were guilty of sin and walked away. Then Jesus stood up and he said, where are your accusers? Nobody's here. They've all gone. He said, then I don't condemn you either. To go and sin no more. What compassion. What an example of love that is from our Lord and our Savior. And aren't we as His followers supposed to emulate that love, that compassion for other people? To try to follow in His footsteps? To be as Christ-like as we can so to perhaps realize is that we too are sinners. So when we're faced with somebody that we have to forgive, remember that we had to be forgiven. 
that God forgive us. Yeah, that's not right. Forgave. God forgives. Forgave. God forgave us as well. Right? Forgiveness is hard. That's hard stuff. Some of us hold grudges for 10 years. Just like <laughs> I couldn't help but throw that in, though. <laughs> but some of us do have a hard time with letting go. Sometimes it's something so small and it's torn our relationships apart because we've let that something so small become so, so big in our minds. We can't do that, folks. That's not what that's not what God calls us to do. That's not who Christ calls us to be. He says, "Forgive us our debts, our transgressions, our trespasses," and that's the good part. And we like that, don't we? I like the fact that God forgives me because I know I'm an imperfect person, that I'm a work in progress, and that when I mess up. I can go to God and ask forgiveness and He'll say like He said to the woman, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. And I'll go out and try my best not to sin again. But ultimately I'm a human being with all my frailties and all my imperfections. And just like everybody else, we all make mistakes. Right? But it's good to know that we worship a God who's loving and whose grace is so amazing that it encompasses all those frailties. All those shortcomings. And it'd be nice if the prayer ended there, wouldn't it? Because that's the part we like. But then it goes on to say, as what? Well, I forgive those who put their trash in my can, or I forgive those who who, who are indebted to me or have transgressed against me or trespassed against me. And that's hard. That's where the edge of the forgiveness sword gets kind of tough, doesn't it? Because I'm okay with being forgiven, but I'm really hard to forgive. And I can tell you, I know it's hard to forgive. Because there are times that I have struggled with it too. But it's part of being a follower of Christ. There's a book written, the, um, the Great Hunger, and it tells of, of a man who was new to a farming community. He came and didn't like people. He was just one of those people. He just didn't like other people. Just be careful. So when people tried to be friends with him, didn't want none of that. He didn't care about his neighbors. He didn't care about anybody in the town. He put up a fence, no trespassing signs, stay off my property. I don't want anything to do with anybody. Well, one day, a young girl in the community crawls under the fence because she sees a dog on the other side and she wants to pet the dog. And the dog leaps upon her and kills her. And the community is outraged. There's no forgiveness there. There's no acceptance there. As a matter of fact, no one will even speak to the man. He goes into town. People won't talk to him. He goes to the store to buy seed and no one will sell him seed for his farm. He is a complete outcast. And then one day, the father of the girl shows up with seed and plants his crop for him. And the gesture of love is so much that the man is overcoming. He says, of all people, of this entire community, why would you do this? Why would you come and show love to me, compassion to me? And the man replies quite simply this, because he keeps God alive in my heart. See, that's what forgiveness does. It 
keeps God alive in your heart. When you're able to reach out and forgive someone, you're, you are a reflection of that forgiveness that God has given you. That amazing grace. You see, grace isn't meant just to be kept. It's meant to be given. Forgiveness isn't something that you collect and put up on the shelf. It's something you take in and you give out. Because that is what Christ calls us to do time and time again. But Peter says, how many times do I forgive? Seven? No. Seventy times. Seven. There is no limit. There is no, there is no non-forgiveness in Jesus. And as followers, that's what we're called to do. Probably the most visual thing I've seen of this in my lifetime is back in 2006. And some of you may recall this. It was October 2006 and a, a dairy driver went into an Amish school and shot 11 girls. He went in there with a grudge in his heart. He had lost his daughter years ago and could not forgive God for that. And so he went into this Amish school and directed the boys to leave and the adults as well. Then he lined the girls up on the bullets of, on the blackboard and he used wire and zip ties and he tied their legs together. And when the police arrived, he talked to them, he talked to his, well, he talked to his wife, then he talked to the police, and then he began shooting them. And when the police rushed the building, he turned the gun on himself and killed himself. Now he shot 11. Four died there on the spot. A fifth would die later on uh, at the hospital. A horrific act to shoot children. The response you would think would be one of outrage and one of hatred, unforgiveness, finger pointing, blame casting. But that's not what happened. Do you remember what happened? By early that afternoon, one of the grandfathers, <clears throat> one of the grandfathers of the one of the girls killed, offered his forgiveness to the shooter. By that afternoon, Amish neighbors of the family that Charles Roberts had left, the shooter had left behind, uh, went to their house to comfort and console them. There was no blame, no finger pointing, no news conferences with lawyers. No calls for riots. There was simply forgiveness. Robert Charles Blake's family was invited to the funeral of one of the little girls. And Charles, excuse me, Roberts, Charles Robert, when at his funeral, there were more Amish than non-Amish people. It was a community that offered forgiveness. They realized that he was a tormented man. That offered him love, his family love, and compassion of the God they worshiped because that's who they were. So much so that when money flowed in to help pay for funerals and the likes from people around the country, 
they took some of that money and set up scholarship funds for his children. That's a special kind of forgiveness, isn't it? That is a reflection of the God that they worship. Do our actions reflect that? <clears throat> Sometimes I have to ask myself, do my actions reflect that of my Lord and my Savior? <clears throat> Most of the time I like to think, yes, they do. Sometimes I fail to. Forgiveness is something that's meant to be extended to us. It's meant to be given, not just received. That's why it says, forgiven our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. So what are you going to do? Is the question. What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do next time somebody puts, tries to put their trash in your can? I have two choices there, really. It's unforgiveness, which is not what Christ calls us to do. You know, unforgiveness is like, <laughs> and holding a grudge is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. That's, <laughs> that's how silly that is. And you get these things and you let them build up inside you, and they're not healthy for you physically, and they're not healthy for you spiritually. Because it separates you from God. The healthy answer is forgiveness. It's what Christ called us to do. It's what we're about. It's who we are. It's what makes us different. Isn't it? It's one of those things that makes us different when we're able to reflect the love of our Savior Jesus Christ. So when you pray, pray those words. Lord, forgive me my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me. And in doing so, remember this. The way that's worded means I want forgiveness as I give forgiveness. Forgive me as I forgive others. Is how you're asking to be judged. So forgive. Forgive and let it go. That's the song goes. Let it go. And be healed spiritually. And be reconciled with your God because when you do that, it keeps God alive in your heart. So when you pray, pray hard for forgiveness. But pray harder to be able to forgive. Because as my good friend Tom Brown says, there's nothing like prayer to ruin a good hate. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.